I wish you warmly welcome to this uh, organ event organized uh, by the Greens European Free Alliance group uh, on uh, the investor state uh, dispute settlement mechanism uh, being uh, uh, considered for the uh, uh, transatlantic trade and investment partnership. Um, I'm very happy to see uh, people from different communities, uh, from uh, MEP offices, from political groups, from outside the House, from legal services, NGOs, uh, and other stakeholders. So be warmly welcome. And uh, everyone has the right to, to, to take the floor in this meeting in the time limits we have. So I'll be quite strict with, uh, with speaking times and uh, question times. Uh, so. Um, why um, this idea of a conference? Uh, we are going to hear and discuss what effects the ISDS mechanism has to the European Union and its member states and its citizens, of course, and, and stakeholders. Um, a legal Affairs Committee of, of this Parliament is responsible for the application and monitoring of Union law and its compliance with primary law and international law uh, in as far as the European Union is affected. So it's very appropriate that also the, the team of our group in the Legal Affairs Committee, which I'm the coordinator of, uh, and uh, more broadly the European Parliament, will take these considerations very seriously. And I'm not exactly sure at the moment that this is the case. So the Parliament has to take the legal problems and legal challenges that the ISDS will uh, present to us very seriously because it's, it's very much about accountability and democracy. The essential point here is that uh, with the ISDS, the EU is perhaps irrevocably handing out its decision of judicial power from the established EU's and member states' court system to less transparent and at worst arbitrary arbitration panels. So ISDS is not just a dispute settlement mechanism. It is a shift of power, and we in the European Parliament must be aware of its dimensions. So, um, quite recently, the Court of Justice of the European Union gave its opinion number 2 slash 13. It was about the European Union's accession to the European Court of Human Rights. The Court said that the European Union must safeguard its powers and that international agreements, such as the TTIP, should not have an adverse effect on the autonomy of the EU legal order. And uh, I hope we get a chance to, to consider some consequences of this, this milestone judgment from the Court of Justice. ISDS would apply to TTIP that in part will become a part of the EU law. To my understanding, in order to be compatible with the EU law, there should be a mechanism in the ISDS that provides the possibility to review the results of the ISDS arbitration against the EU primary law in the Court of Justice. Is this kind of ISDS possible? Does the inclusion of the ISDS require the amending of the Treaty of the Functioning of the European Union, namely Article 267 about preliminary rulings? We are just now in the critical junction where the European Parliament can still do something and we need to take this opportunity seriously. And whatever the European Union is doing, we cannot afford to create an inherent conflict within the EU legal system. So, um, uh, dear ladies and gentlemen, um, I would like to proudly present the three speakers that we have here to explain their views and to bring insights to ISDS in the international law and the EU law context. And uh, please make a good use of their expertise, and I hope that there will be time for questions. Let me just uh, mention that this uh, meeting is web streamed, and the, the web streaming, the, the record will be available, or at least on, on our group's website. There's a specific uh, website for TTIP as well. So, firstly, the first speaker will be Professor Marti Koskeniemi. Uh, he's a distinguished international law scholar. Uh, he has um, been working and is working with University of Helsinki, New York University, and Université de Paris. Uh, and he's also a former diplomat who has advised Finland as well as the United Nations. And so I would ask him first to explain how ES ISDS and investment, investment law in general fits into the framework of international law. But I will go on the presentations. Our second speaker will be Professor Harm Scheppel. 
Uh, Professor Sheppel is a law professor from the University of Kent Law School. He researches uh, European law and international economic law, and especially investment treaty arbitration law. He will tell us about the investment treaties in the EU legal order and the experiences regarding investment treaties. And thirdly, we have uh, Mr. Colin Brown. Uh, Mr. Brown is a deputy head of unit uh, dispute settlement and legal aspects of trade policy from DG Trade European Commission. And he's hands-on working with the TTIP negotiations and the ISDS. He will tell us about the ISDS as an element of EU trade policy. So, uh, be most uh, warmly welcome to take part in the discussion. Now, let's start with Professor Koskeniemi. Marty, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. And welcome to this warm atmosphere in this uh, <laughs> Brasselois afternoon. Um, I, of course, have no clue as to how much you already know about the ISDS, and it is one of those hopeless legal abbreviations that can contain whatever. If I used all my time to explain it, uh, that wouldn't uh, further my purpose, which is to try to argue why there is no need for ISDS. So ISDS in the TTIP treaty. So the ISDS has to do with lifting a certain number of cases away from the European legal system as well as from the American legal system, namely cases that American investors in Europe raise against uh, European states or possibly uh, European investors in Alabama, as uh, uh, it was once pointed out to me, might raise against the United States. Uh, the states themselves have no uh, right of initiative. They can't take the companies. Uh, so the idea is that in Europe and in the United States, uh, either the European or the American or European investors would be so badly discriminated that they need to have another legal system administered by three arbitrators, arbitrators who do not work with uh, the liability of judges in Geneva or Washington uh, under the, in a system administered and from the 1960s under the World Bank. There are a number of cases that have been decided under the bilateral investment treaties in the past years, around 300 of them, and many of you, I'm sure, are familiar with the invitation to consider the details of those cases, Vattenfall cases, the Philip Morris cases, um, Agua del Tunari case, the many, many cases are controversial and, and problematic. Now, what I suggest to you that that's shockingly irrelevant, that we don't need to go enter those legal uh, details because the whole system is completely unnecessary. And why would it be unnecessary? Well, for the single re simple reason that the European and American legal systems are by far the most advanced legal systems there are. In 2010, 100 American corporate lawyers were interviewed about how important they feel that a special investment protection system is needed for American investors to invest in Europe. Transpired that many of them thought, well, it has no significance for an investment decision whatsoever. And mostly, they pointed out that, well, the people who make those investment decisions have never heard of this alternative. And why would they here? Because they regularly decide cases. Americans come to European courts. Europeans go to, um, uh, to American courts. The Commission has done good work in order to try to figure out whether there are cases where Europeans would have been discriminated, and finally came up with two dubious examples, one having to do with the Cuban quarantine, which certainly is not something that's going to be expired uh, by the TTIP. And Europe, well, I know of no justified American claim that would have been, uh, would not have received fair treatment here. So a couple of weeks ago, I had the advantage of speaking to the American uh, delegation uh, and a member dealing with the ISDS problems. I asked him, well, why do you need this? And he said, there are two reasons. One of the reasons is that we've always done this. It's no wonder also because they've had it in the NAFTA, in the North American free trade area, and they never lost a case. Um, but second reason would, was, well, because if Europe and United States agree on something, then the, uh, the amount of trade and investment under that treaty would be so great that this would be 
um, universal standard. So those are the two reasons I asked. What more do you need? And if you were Americans, well, you wouldn't need anything more because the universal standard would apply above all to those multinational companies, which you and I know very well, which are owned by Americans, those interests. Surely the American policy is to take disputes regarding those interests away from the domestic contexts where, they, where the uh, problems emerge to be decided where? In Washington, for instance, between people who are in this very small circle of investment arbitrators trained where? Well, New York University, Harvard, Yale, Stanford, you name it. Uh, I know many of these people, many of them are my best friends. They are okay. <laughs> But they are just humans. And if you read those cases, you know that the cases have been recited left and right with the same facts. Now, seriously, the most, si most advanced legal systems are those of Europe and the United States. And the suggestion is to replace that by a system by, administered by ad hoc arbitrators who operate with no judicial liability by reference to a standard called fair and equitable treatment. So they asked to, to, to decide correctly. Okay, so uh, that's not serious. Uh, and above all, I would say the system is unjust. I speak to Finnish Scandinavian politicians and they asked me, Marti, why is this needed? Why would we allow Americans to come here and take cases having to do with Finnish environmental legislation, Finnish health legislation, Finnish taxation legislation, and ask for compensation for that we never can ask and, and, and have some foreigners who've never visited, even Helsinki, but Helsinki, of course, is not Finland, uh, haven't visited any part of the country and to, be, to decide on compensation. And what can I say? I can only say, well, I spoke to the American person and he said there are these two reasons. We've always done this and we need it because we want to have a global standard. That is to say, we want global operators to set the set standard. Okay, so it's not removed. Uh, let me just, in order to dispel the, the mistake that I am just an anti-globalization weirdo, first to point, out, to point out that I'm in favor of free trade and have been known to be a favor in, for a long time. And that removing this monster from this treaty has been proposed by the European Council of Foreign Relations, no less, the Atlantic Council, the Cato Institute, and the former uh, director of the World Bank, Bob Zalik. So there are six problems in this in which one might want to uh, engage it. I just highlight one and then I run through the others. Now concentrate. you are invited to think about those 300 cases approximately, their legal details, as if that were important. You are called upon to look at whether the TTIP treaty provisions can be made slightly better. Here, uh, maybe good European diplomats can tingle with those provisions, propose these provisions. That's insignificant. Because as every lawyer knows, and now pay attention, because, as every lawyer knows, courts and tribunals are not important because of the wisdom of the cases they decide. We don't want cases to go to courts or arbitration. Case arbitration is important because there's a good American saying, because negotiation takes place in the shadow of arbitration. Because the existence of arbitration and courts enables people to negotiate. And not only to negotiate, but to exercise power in those negotiations by saying to the other party, well, if you don't agree, then see you in court. I took a case as a representative of Finland against Denmark to the International Court of Justice some years ago. Some of you may have read it if you've gone to your international law classes, the Great Belt case. We took it. Denmark there because the Danish otherwise said, we are not going to negotiate with you Finns. Who are you to tell us where to build bridges? We took them there. It took 18 months for us to negotiate the settlement to compensate those Finnish companies that were violated. So it's a typical, that's how lawyers operate. 
lawyers use this as the reference under which you negotiate. And now, here is the punchline. The punchline. The system empowers in those negotiations the most powerful global interests that already exist in the world. When this system is in force, irrespective of the legal detail, when this system is in force, then the most powerful American multinational companies can go to domestic administrators, domestic ministries, regional administrations, talk to domestic lawyers and say, well, if you do that, then see you in court. Now, it doesn't matter what the court would decide. The person would have to, to think about what? Think about, for example, that going to, to an arbitration costs, according to the OECD, for a party, approximately 4 to $30 million. I come back at the end to that. So it strengthens the hand of powerful multinationals in negotiation. Their bargaining power will be dramatically increased. That's the by far most significant aspect of this. Second thing is, of course, all of this nit legal nitty-gritty uh, that you are invited to talk as if that were so important. Standards are open-ended. Of course, they are. They are obscure and they are amenable to bias. Lawyers thrill in analyzing the 300 cases and showing, showing how in the seven Argentinian cases, for instance, with the same, same facts, Five cases decided in this way, well, changed arbitrators, two cases decided in that way, and so on. Uh, they are non-transparent, arbitrators are few, they have vested interests, cases with the same facts decided, etc. So all of this is true. They have no sensitivity towards other than the profits of investment. There's the famous statement from the metal-clad case in which a tribunal, having asked to, to decide on a waste disposal plant, and the Mexican government provides all this um, detail about the environmental consequences of the waste disposal plan. And the arbitrators say, oh, it's not our task to decide on the environmental things. The only thing we are called upon to decide is how much was loss of profit to this American company. So, verbatim. Anyway, that's not neither here nor there. Those are, as I said, little details, and the commission dwells in those details because for lawyers, that's fun. Uh, well, there are infamous cases. You all know of these cases. Um, infamous cases. Philip Morris, Vattenfall, Argentina, Aguas del Turani, Chevron, Ecuador, Spanish solar. Sol there are 22 cases now under the Energy Charter Treaty or se specific bilateral investment treaties against Spain because Spain got into economic trouble and had to back down from the subsidies program in which it had promised that for foreign investors can build solar energy um, receptors in Spain. Well, fortunately there's still solar energy, but there's no money in Spain, so see you in court, Spaniards. So, the, well, anyway, so uh, Harm is going to say a few words afterwards that this thing is going to destroy the possibility of debt rescheduling schemes. Argentina has already found itself in dire straits with vulture firms, many of you read astonished in the papers last summer that this American vulture fund that had been buying in a, uh, just a fragment of, the value, of its value Argentinian government bonds, bonds. It, it refused to participate in the debt settlement scheme. Instead, it took Argentina to court. The U.S. Supreme Court said, well, 1.3 billion. You pay this American guy singer the money. Of course, there are cases now against Greece, and there's more to come, and certainly if this thing ever goes through. Um, the next uh, problem, which is that this probably breaches against the European Union law, um, uh, Heidi Hautala already pointed out to that. I was invited to a, a conference on the establishment of the European Federation on Investment Law and Arbitration last January. So this is a lobbying firm in favor of arbitration. I was invited there because it's nice to have a person also talking this way uh, for, with the arbitrators. But it was interesting anthropologically for me because the insiders in the arbitration crowd were astounded, astounded by the Court of Justice in, Luxem in Luxembourg by the case concerning 
the EU accession to the European Court of Human Rights. Impossible that the European Union could be a part of the European Court of Human Rights and that the European Court of Human Rights could have some authority to say anything about how things in Europe stand. So if the European Court of Human Rights cannot say, so how can these three ad hoc arbitrators in Washington, of whom he never heard, let alone chosen, could be able to say something about European law? So, of course, it's against European law. Um, so it turns EU into a sitting duck. So, uh, I already uh, mentioned that in the 35 cases raised by the United States against Canada, it has, the Americans have targeted every single bit of important Canadian legislation. The Europeans will be similarly targeted. Now you would say, well, it's not that serious. We have good lawyers here as well. Now, so here is an example of a, of a situation. Let's say an American mining company invests in mining in, around Brussels, let's say in the Waterloo area. And they found out, whoops, well, it's, there's no minerals to be found in the Waterloo area. But the Americans had invested. The chief ex executive officer, official turns in despair because the, the annual meeting is coming. And the shareholders will ask, well, what happened here? Um, the ex chief executive officer asks the company's lawyer, what can I do? Well, the lawyers will say, well, Madam President, uh, let's take Belgium to an arbitration and let's see if we can attribute the fact that we haven't received the profits that we have to some piece of legislation or in Belgium. The CEO would say, well, but that would be tremendously costly, wouldn't it? Well, but the lawyer, because he has been in uh, listening to um, courses given by famous professors at institutions uh, which you know, would say, well, no problem, no problem, because there is this thriving new industry on third-party financing. And uh, some of these industries are very well known. Here are two of them, Juridica and Burford. They are two companies specialized in third-party financing, that is to say, financing cases of other people. Here is what they have in their results of 2012. They report, Juridica, that out of seven cases they had financed, they got 85% of profits. Burford, even more famous as a third party financing, has financed 14 cases, among them many of the cases against Argentina, 70% of profits. So, the lawyer will say to the chief executive officer, no problem, because we turn to Juridica or Burford, they will pay our claim and let's see what happens. So, sitting duck. There, at the end of the day, and you'll be relieved to hear that this will come to an end, um, at the end of the day, politicians tell me that, well, but we need it because of China. We need it because we have to, if we don't do it with America, or the America, if we don't do it among ourselves, we can't do it with China. Nonsense. The Chinese have been making bilateral investment treaties with uh, binding investor state dispute settlement for 15 years. Well, they would say, but, but you see, if we don't do, it's hard really Europeans with their negotiations with China later on to say, with Chinese we do, with Americans we don't do. Nonsense. Why is that? Well, the latest um, bilateral investment treaty that was concluded by China, but with Australia. And Australia is well known as, as a country that objects, objects to uh, ISDS. In November, however, Miraculously, they agreed to have ISDS in the Australia-China deal. But wait, wait a minute, is there a complete misunderstanding here? Because just a few years ago, a Chinese um, uh, investor, insurer, Ping An, raised a claim under a bilateral investment treaty against Belgium. So the Chinese have no problem in using this system. And why would they have? They are among the world's most important investors. This thing works for the Chinese, large Chinese companies, as it works for the large American companies. And so, um, I come to a conclusion, you'll be relieved to hear, and it's a really a warm uh, afternoon, and there's been a lot of broken English thrown at you in, the, in a kind of Finnish English 
Uh, so I apologize for that. Many abbreviations, uh, incomprehensible, legal details, uninteresting and boring. So here is the punchline. I'm a professor of international law, pretty well known in my profession. I'm here as an expert. I'm kind of in favor of free trade. What is my role? My role is to inform European politicians about the costs, about the costs that are involved in making TTIP. It's for European politicians to decide whether these costs are worth paying because of the advantages, the undeniable advantages that the trade part of the TTIP will provide. For me, I don't believe that the costs are well understood by Europeans. Europeans, legalistic and optimistic they, as they are, they think everyone in this world is a good faith person, a good faith investor, a good faith politician. And with good faith people, it's nice to agree. Now, I'm a lawyer, and I, as a former lawyer, 17 years for my government, I, politicians always said, Marty, you're a person who has a problem for every solution. <laughs> but that's what lawyers are for. Lawyers are there to inform. I understand that the, the photo opportunity is waiting, and the politician is busy to get to the cocktail party, and it's nice to sign a big, important trade treaty. It, one doesn't want to hear that there are problems on the way. Thank you. So now you have heard the most calm and cool Finnish diplomat. <laughs> You know that they are famous for that. <laughs> anyway, thank you very much for these uh, uh, tough uh, challenges that we're going to discuss afterwards. And now I have the pleasure to invite Professor uh, Harm Schäppel to take the floor. Harm. Sorry, I'm, I'm waiting for the yeah. PowerPoint to... Uh, right, there you go. Um, it's almost always downhill from Marti Koskenyemi, and it will be this time as well. Um, but I will just try and say what I have to say about um, the ISDS provisions as planned in CETA and in, um, in TTIP on EU law. Um, I think the debate on ISDS, however uh, energetic or toxic, has established two important things. First, its instrumental value in attracting new investment uh, is, um, most serious people would agree, close to zero. Second, the investment treaty arbitration regime as it currently exists in the world um, is indefensible. Um, this is clear from the Commission's own consultation documents and from the text that was negotiated in CETA. Um, it is fair to say that you could read those documents as a very incisive critique of current um, practice. And so let me say from the outset, and that's just uh, because Mr. Brown is here, um, those texts in CETA and in TTIP are far, far better than most treaties um, currently existing. Um, but they're not good enough. Um, I've explained that at length uh, with uh, colleagues uh, Murwat, McClinsky, and Gus van Harten, who is here um, in a, the contribution to the consultation process. But today, um, I want to talk about EU law. So, if we accept these two things, that instrumentally it's not very useful and that the current system of investment arbitration is not very good, uh, the question, the gaping question is why do we want ISCS in the first place? One of the answers to this question seems to be, well, why not? What do we have to fear? We have the most developed legal systems in the world and what could investment treaties possibly um, detract from our legal values? Well, a lot. Um, and to explain this, I'll, I shall first briefly and very, very quickly um, explain something about international investment law. These treaties generally provide for two kinds of substantive standards. Relative standards, which is basically a norm of non-discrimination. Thou shalt not treat foreign investors any worse than you treat domestic investors. And then there are so-called absolute standards. Now, historically, these two, the norm of no expropriation without compensation and the norm 
imposing fair and equitable treatment were written for a very precise reason. That is, if we have a major socialist revolution which nationalizes all industry, or if we have a complete breakdown in a country and the mob goes through the streets pillaging and looting all businesses, the norm of non-discrimination will not necessarily be very useful to foreign investors. And so these two are written as a minimum standard um, of absolute treatment. Now the way that investment law has evolved is these two have been um, elevated to the status of an autonomous norm imposing behavior on states. Largely, it seems dominant now to provide a stable legal and business framework. Treaties generally provide um, recourse to arbitration directly, that is, bypassing domestic courts. Now, um, systemically, the higher the level of protection in a particular legal system in a host state, the less important these absolute standards will be. Indeed, ideally, all we would really need is a norm of non-discrimination because the other norms are already protected in the Union. And this um, seems to be what the European institutions are committed to. This is the uh, so-called no greater rights principle laid down uh, in a recital in the regulation on financial responsibility for arbitration awards. Union agreements shall not afford higher protection to um, foreign investors than it affords to domestic investors. Now, it is just a recital, and I'm not sure how many people take it seriously or how many people remember it. Um, I do know it's untenable. This is clear already um, from the uh, regulation itself, that is Article 3, must be read as allowing for the possibility that the application of union law will attract liability under investment law. Now, um, but let's try and take it seriously. The first question is who decides, that is, who decides on whether or not EU law is compatible with these investment protection provisions, and these are investment um, tribunals. And so we get to the issue of the autonomy of EU law and opinion 213. Now, as um, Hari Hautala and Marti Koskenyemi have already alluded to, it is um, problematic, the compatibility of ISDS provisions with the um, pronouncements of the court in opinion 213. I find it hard to be as categorical as uh, Marti is um, because uh, the court is uh, spectacularly dense in its reasoning. Um, on the one hand, it rather generously allows for the possibility that an international agreement may be um, set up a court whose decisions are binding on the institutions, including on the court itself. On the other hand, on the other hand, it um, circumscribes this possibility very, very narrowly. That is, an agreement may not affect the... We'll get there. There you go. It may not affect the indispensable conditions for safeguarding the essential character of those powers. Now, it is clear from the language before um, this passage um, here, for example, um, that what the court is alluding to is the possibility of final control, um, if only through the preliminary reference procedure. Given um, opinion 213, I think the intellectually honest thing to do is to ask the Court of Justice for an opinion on the compatibility of ISDS with EU law. Now, I know the, the Commission has asked for an opinion on the FTA with Singapore, but I think that is only about mixed competences. Um, and so I hope that someone will ask the court the question. Okay, let's then talk about the um, substantive um, uh, comparison between EU law and investment protection law. Under investment law, states can be held responsible or liable for damages arising out of regulatory or legislative action. Um, in EU law, this is um, by and large impossible. Um, the court will not allow non-contractual liability for legislative measures. 
mostly because of so-called regulatory chill, that is what Marti Koskenyemi talked about, the prospect of damages may lead uh, legislators to um, be impeded from legislating in the general interest, overriding individual interests. And so the only way really seriously for investors um, within a domestic EU context to start um, a litigation is to conceptualize their rights as fundamental rights. Now, in EU law, this is not straightforward. Um, the court has repeatedly said that the right to property is not an absolute prerogative, but must be viewed in its social function. And moreover, it may well be um, disregarded by um, legislative measures, as long as it is not disproportionate and intolerable interference. Moreover, we tend to think of the internal market as a great liberal project, but of course, historically, it is not. Um, and the long history of the common organization of the market and milk quotas and export licenses has led to a long line of litigation of operators claiming that they have lost profits from these common organizations. The court has always held that a um, change in commercial fortunes brought about by legislative change does not give rise to liability. Contrast this with the pronouncement on fair and equitable treatment from arbitration tribunals. The idea here is investment treaties guarantee a stable business and legal framework. Now, I know that the uh, CETA text and the TTIP text try to narrow down the so-called FET standard to particular legal values discrimination, arbitrariness, due process, and so forth. But as is clear from these quotes, investment tribunals derive the importance of FET from um, general international law. They hold this to be general principles and customary international law, uh, largely because they wrote it. And so they will, in all likelihood, read these principles into the meaning of such things as due process and arbitrariness, and it may well undermine the efforts of the negotiating parties to narrow it down. But mostly, the no greater rights principle is to be, will be almost inevitably violated by the way that arbitration tribunals see their own role and function. This here is a quote from Quasar um, against Russia. This is one of the UCOS um, test cases, whereby a very authoritative tribunal um, explained quite clearly why it is that foreigners may invoke higher standards of protection than domestic investors. To its credit, it did this in general terms and not on legal technicalities. And so the political theory of that tribunal goes as follows. First, investment treaties are designed to induce investors to come over. And for this tribunal, it follows logically that they should not be treated, hence, um, as badly or well as locals, but that they should be treated much better. Their rights should not be subordinated to the general interest in the way that their, the rights of domestic individuals are submitted to, diluted by margins of appreciation. Second, domestic investors are part of a political community and the price to pay for political participation is that the political community may at times demand sacrifices for the general interest, but since foreign investors are not part of that political community, they cannot be asked to pay that price. I will go on with two examples um, in EU law why I think um, foreign investors may be um, much better off than EU investors. One is on tax rulings. Um, you may know that the Commission is investigating Ireland and the Netherlands for um, so-called selective tax advantages to Apple and Starbucks. What will happen? if the Commission finds that state aid has been granted, that the member states will be obliged under EU law to recover that aid. Now, this is, of course, uh, not nice. 
Uh, on the one hand, uh, the member state will be obliged to recover the aid from these companies, and these companies may well feel that they should be able to rely on the assurances of the national, national tax authorities that they would basically not pay any taxes. Under EU law, domestic investors in such a situation have no chance whatsoever. All aid has to be notified, and a diligent businessman should know whether aid has been notified or not, and so you may not harbor legitimate expectations that the aid was lawful after all. Under investment law, The situation is far, far different. This is one instance where the doctrine of legitimate expectations, even in its reduced form, as in CETA and TTIP, will bite with full force. That is, investors will be able to rely on specific representations made by President Juncker or tax authorities that no taxes were to be paid for a uh, period of time. In the end, then, what would we have? We would have a situation where, under EU law, the member state is obliged to recover unpaid taxes and under investment law it is very likely that the company will be able to recover those recovered unpaid taxes from the member state concerned. Perhaps the more serious issue still is the issue of public debt. Some investment treaties explicitly include public debt in the scope of the treaty. Some of them explicitly um, exclude it. Most, however, do with um, more or less the definitions as I give them here. A broad asset-based definition of investment, CETA even includes claims to money, and a definition of investor which um, demands investments to be made in the territory of the other party. Now, since a case called Abaclot against Argentina a few years ago, it seems clear that tribunals will um, allow for the possibility that holders of sovereign debt are to be considered investors and are to be considered, um, are to be protected under these investment treaties. This has consequences, um, for example, if you um, have a view of Greece. Um, the 2012 so-called haircut involved a um, restructuring of debt with private creditors. Um, it's interesting to note that foreign, the bonds under foreign law were paid back in full, at least to the holdouts, for fear of litigation. But instead, the majority of the, the whole of the debt held under Greek law bonds was exchanged the claim that is, has been made against Greece is that they have expropriated um, bondholders by unilaterally retrofitting bonds with so-called collective action clauses. Now, if you are a so-called holdout um, litigator in Greece and you try to bring a case against Greece under Greek law, your chances are, I submit, rather slim. If you try to do this under EU law or the, even the European Convention of Human Rights, your chances are uh, a bit better, but not very much. And so what is happening is that holdout litigators are suing Greece under bilateral investment treaties, under the Greek-Slovak bit and under the Greek-Cypriot bit. Knowing this, um, there are two things that could have been done. Um, one, the negotiating parties um, could have explicitly excluded public debt from the treaty. This is what uh, Canada used to do under its 2004 by, um, model bit, and this is what has been done in NAFTA. Uh, this is not what the Commission in Canada chose to do. Instead, what they did was um, import some language from U.S. treaties with South American countries and basically provide protection against so-called vulture funds. That is, in case of a debt restructuring, if a majority of 75% agrees to the debt restructuring, the minority is bound by that majority decision, and no claim can be brought, um, at least not under the absolute standards of um, fair and equitable treatment and expropriation, 
but a claim can be brought for non-discrimination. And so again, the CETA exception is much, much better than most current investment treaties. It provides at least some protection against vulture funds, and it would have been enough to prevent both Abaclat and Postova Banca. On the other hand, what CETA does is confirm and legitimize a principle, and that is that government debt is in principle an investment to be protected and a property right to be enforced under international law. This is a bit strange if you realize that government bonds are priced according to the risk of default. That is, the risk is already insured. There are important policy implications to this that have not been discussed enough um, in the debate on ISDS. You could wonder whether investment tribunals are suitable for, um, for dealing with sovereign bankruptcy. They will not look at these issues um, balancing the rights of creditors against the hardship of the people involved, against the claims of um, uh, monetary institutions, or against the interests of taxpayers of bailout countries, what they will see are property rights that are to be enforced. It solves one collective action problem that is between creditors, but it comes up with another one. If your uh, bonds are enforceable property rights under international law, um, the question is why would any creditor agree to a debt restructuring? That is, the bargaining position of the debtor state collectively against creditors will be weakened. And there are geopolitical issues. There are efforts underway on the international level to come to a treaty-based bankruptcy mechanism, and, and instead the ISDS mechanism uh, concentrates on the contractual side of things. Conclusions then. In all likelihood, ISDS is incompatible with the principle of autonomy of EU law, as enunciated in Opinion 213. The investment chapters in CETA and TTIP will inevitably and of necessity violate the no greater rights principle, and the investment chapters in CETA and TTIP will almost inevitably restrict policy space for the EU and for the member states. I'll stop there. Thank you very much, Harm. Uh, now we have also uh, included in the discussion uh, the problems uh, of sovereign debt and uh, the very topical issue of tax rulings also. So uh, it's my pleasure to, to give now the floor to um, uh, Colin Brown. And uh, as I said at the beginning, uh, he's really hands-on uh, on the negotiation. And um, now uh, I would like to give uh, the floor to you, Colin. You're most welcome. Thank you very much, and let me thank the Green Group for having invited me to, to speak here. Um, let me start by saying that this agreement will be ultimately uh, an international agreement negotiated by the Commission, but it will be for the European Parliament, amongst others, to ratify the agreement. Um, so the debate that you're having today and the other debates that you're having are extre extremely um, important, and the Commission is happy to contribute to that and to play its part in that. Um, now I, um, I don't think that I will manage to be as eloquent um, as Professor Koskinemi. Um, I um, also am not sure that I'll be able to get into all of the details that Professor Sheppel went into, but I would like to, to broadly do three things um, in, my, in my short uh, presentation. I would like to talk a little bit about um, how, this, um, how the system of ISDS uh, fits in international law. What are we talking about in terms of international law? I would like to respond also to some of the comments and the questions that have come up on its relationship with EU law, and in, and in particular on the case law of the Court of Justice uh, on the ability of the Union to subject itself to international courts. And then I will um, finish by saying a few words on what the Commission has already done. Some of this has been um, touched upon and what the Commission uh, is currently working on. Now, I think a first important thing is to really identify what, what we are talking about, and Professor Sheppel did that. There are essentially 
four standards which can be applied by investor state dispute settlement tribunals. Those four standards are the non-discrimination standard, the um, protection against uncompensated um, expropriation, um, protection against uh, unfair and inequitable treatment, and the, uh, an assurance that uh, profits can be transferred back to the home state of the investor. Now, it's important to understand that investor state dispute settlement only applies to a potential breach of those four standards. So none of the other things that are being looked at in TTIP or that are included in SETA would ever be subject to the um, ISDS um, provisions. It's also very important to look at what, um, what, uh, what types of companies bring ISDS cases and what do they bring them about. So a study has been carried out by the, the Dutch government, requested by the Dutch government, on ISDS cases. And they reviewed all of the cases in existence and concluded that 90%, 90% of cases concerned individual decisions of, say, local authorities or regional authorities. So those 90% were administrative matters, like whether to grant a license or not. Only 10% could be described as going against regulatory measures, general regulatory measures. And the study concluded that it was not convinced that those cases had been successful in challenging regulatory measures. And in terms of the types of investors that bring the cases, it is not, as Professor Koskinmeni was suggesting, multinationals. There are some, of course. But the vast majority of cases are brought by medium-sized companies, even by small um, companies, because the, 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 the logic is these are the companies that will not be protected by their governments um, in the event of political discussions. Now, I wanted to say a few words about the relationship and how this fits into the general regime of um, international law. Um, and we're in... Um, um, Ms. Hatula is um, in the jury committee, the coordinator of the Greens for the Jury Committee, so I'd like to get into a little bit more of, of, of the legal detail of, of what we're talking about. The first thing is to be very clear that the international agreements, the international trade and investment agreements that include okay. investor state dispute settlement, and certainly the ones being negotiated by the EU, will not be directly applicable in the domestic legal systems. So you will not be able to go to a domestic court and say, um, the city of Brussels has breached um, the non-discrimination principle in the investment protection chapter, and I would like that decision to be annulled. In the very same way, the United States, Canada, uh, all of the countries that, with whom we're negotiating, they do not allow these international agreements to be enforced in the domestic <coughs> courts. What does that mean? It means things like um, under U.S. law, there's no prohibition against discrimination. So it's possible to discriminate against foreign companies. And, and Marty gave an example of discrimination linked to the US sanctions on Cuba. That is perfectly possible under US law. And there's nothing that can be done in US law about that. Because US judges will correctly apply US law and will come to the conclusion that that is perfectly proper. The United States has been condemned in the World Trade Organization for that very piece of legislation because it discriminated, amongst other things. The European Union has been trying for 10 years to get the United States to change that legislation. It's consistently refused. So what is ISDS? ISDS, like the, the World Trade Organization disputes in one mechanism, is a system for settling disputes. Its function is perfectly compatible or comparable to international courts. Um, again, Marty's referred to the International Court of Justice. There are plenty of international courts which are operating within the EU, which the EU and its member states have strongly promoted. So the system of ISDS is essentially nothing more than a, a dispute settlement mechanism comparable to what you find in international courts. Now, there may be things that need to be improved about that, and I'll come to that. Um, I'm not saying that the system is, is perfect as it exists, but it's, if you want, its logical functioning is very similar to an international court. 
And let me give you one example of a case that took place in the United States um, that is an example of the types of cases where ISDS would come into play. In the United States, there was a, there was a case of a Canadian funeral home company. Um, these are the normal types of things that ISDS really involves. Um, they got into a contractual dispute um, in Mississippi. The contractual dispute was in the order of uh, $5 million, $10 million. Uh, significant for those companies, but in the order of things, not particularly significant. The dispute ended up in a court in Mississippi. The Mississippi court, for reasons which were clearly discriminatory, awarded the, um, found that the Canadian company was in breach of contract and awarded $400 million in damages against the Canadian company. So they had a contractual dispute of $10 million and they had um, uh, an award of damages of, of $400 million against them. In order to appeal the case, so just to go from that, that court to the next court, the company had to get 125% um, of the damages awarded against it to submit as a deposit to the appeal court. So it had to find $625 million. Um, now, obviously, it couldn't do that. It was a small company operating in the, in the millions, not in the tens of millions, never mind the hundreds of millions. Um, it tried to start an ISDS case against the U.S. The, um, the arbitrators found that the United States had breached the standards, but in the meantime, the company had gone bankrupt and had become an American company, and so the, the tribunal in that case dismissed the case not on the grounds of substance, but because the, uh, the company in question was no longer a foreign investor. So the basic point on, as regards the relationship to international law is that all we are talking about here is a system of enforcement of international obligations. Those international obligations do not necessarily correspond to what is in the domestic system. The strength of the domestic system is entirely irrelevant. The US has more than 130 cases against it in, in, uh, in the WTO. Um, but it's essentially a system of enforcing international law. Now, as regards EU law, and this I turn to my second point, Professor Scheffel was absolutely right that the Court of Justice has, since at least 1991, recognized that because the EU can subject itself to international agreements, it can subject itself to international courts. So since 1991, the EU has been entering into agreements which involve international courts. And there are plenty of examples of, of, of those in the field of trade policy, and the most well-known one is the World Trade Organization with its system of panel uh, and appellate bodies. The key issue, and this is important in here, if I could use Marty's terms, you have to concentrate. The key thing is that we need to look at what powers are given to these bodies. And the court has said, and here I'm quoting from the opinion, that the international agreement must not have the effect of binding the EU and its institution in the exercise of their internal powers to a particular interpretation of the rules of EU law. So, the, what, is, what can the international courts not do? They cannot interpret EU law in a way that is binding on the EU institutions. So they, they cannot tell the Commission, the Parliament, the Council, above all the Court of Justice, that this provision of the, of the EU treaties means X, or this provision of directive so-and-so means Y. Now, this issue is something that the Commission has been aware of since day one when the competence for investment was transferred to, to the EU, and it is something that we have been very careful to, to, to handle. The first thing to be clear is that ISDS tribunals cannot order changes in legislation. All they can do is order compensation. So they, they cannot bind the EU, the EU institutions, to act in a particular way in terms of the interpretation of EU law. Second important issue is that EU law might be relevant. There might indeed be a case concerning EU law. But if there is, the tribunal will only be examining EU law as a matter of fact. It will be determining what does this particular provision mean so that it can decide whether the EU or the member state in question has acted consistently with 
uh, its international obligations, not with the question of EU law. And in that sense, it is absolutely identical to the World Trade Organization, to um, any other international court that the EU has become party to over the years. And that's why I think we are comfortable that the ISDS system as such needs improvement, but as such is consistent with the Court of Justice's case law on um, its, the ability of the EU to subject itself to international courts. I wanted to make two brief comments also on um, what Professor Shelfels said about responsibility for legislative actions and as regards um, state aids. Um, the, the first thing is that the EU agreements, and I admit there are lots of old agreements which are less clear, make it clear that an investor has no, um, has no right to believe that um, uh, the legal environment will remain stable and predictable. It's very clear that the, um, the investment substantive provisions as defined, and I'm going to talk about this in a second, in SETA and other places, um, limit the rights of investors to essentially the four that I mentioned earlier, and in particular that the fair and equitable treatment provision doesn't, prevent, doesn't provide for a stable and predictable legal environment as such. The other important thing is that an investor must prove damages. So it, it cannot challenge a, a regulatory measure unless it can show all the way through that it actually suffers damage because of a breach of these four provisions. In our view, it is going to be highly unlikely that that is possible. The same possibility exists under EU law. There is, there is a possibility in exceptional cases for legislative acts to um, um, be such that damages are required. Um, but in our view, the, 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 there's a, a lot of similarity between the, the circumstances in which you will fall. You could potentially fall under ISDS and the, the, the situations you could potentially fall under EU law. Now, on the state aid issue and the, um, the tax breaks and the invest investigations into Starbucks and Apples and others, and of course, those are ongoing investigations, uh, so I'm not going to get into the, the details of them. But I think it's important to underline that even if legitimate expectations is an element which has to be taken into account, those legitimate expectations have to be reasonable. And it is clear under EU law, and it's been repeated again and again and again, that no reasonable operator can believe that subsidies that it is promised will be considered as legal until the Commission has come to a conclusion on them that they are in fact legal. So our thinking is that um, the types of circumstances that uh, Professor Sheppels referred to will not give rise to damages under ISDS. Now let me just close quickly by saying a few things about what we have already done and what we are now working on. Um, as has already been touched upon, there are 3,000 existing treaties um, that provide for, in fact, 3,200 that provide for uh, investment protection in ISDS. There's one concluded statistically every two weeks is, is the average uh, worldwide. Um, the EU has had the competence since 2009 and we've taken a lot of action to, to deal with some of the problems which very clearly um, exist. Some of these are through the clarifications of the substantive standards, so the four standards that I mentioned, in particularly on fair and equitable treatment and uh, expropriation. We've made a lot of changes also on the investor state dispute settlement mechanism as such. And one of the key changes we've made goes to the concern that Marty raised, which is the risk of regulatory or any form of chill. One of the key things that we've done is we've made it clear that the losing party has to pay all of the costs. So that means that the third party financers that, that Marty referred to, or anybody potentially bringing a case, the, the legal counsel of an uh, in-house legal counsel, if he's trying to persuade his CEO to bring a case, has to be honest and will have to understand that if they bring the case and they fail, they will have to, break, they will have to pay all of the costs. And that can be quite expensive indeed, but what it will mean is that investors will only bring cases where there's a clear case. Um, of, of a breach of the standards and not as is possible now just by arguing that there's been unfair and in, unequitable treatment. Um, there was a reference um, 
So we're, we're in a system that's very different from that of the 1960s. And I think an important thing to underline is that the United States also has a modern approach to investment protection and, and ISDS. So some of the things that one hears about no transparency, the US has long championed transparency uh, in the context of ISDS. A few references to the public consultation. As you may know, there are a number of issues which the Commission is committed to work, upon, to work on um, coming out of the consultation. Those are the right to regulate the functioning of and choice of the arbitrators, a possible appeal system, and a link and the links between ISDS and domestic law. We are still working on those issues. We will be coming to the Parliament um, soon on these issues with further ideas on them. Um, the important thing to, undermine, uh, to underline sorry, is that EU investment policy will gradually replace the old system of member states' BITs. So all of the old BITs where you have these risks coming up will gradually be replaced as the EU comes to, to negotiate this. And this, we think, is very important, and I think this is what, in particular, the Green uh, Group would be concerned about. This is very important to make sure that there can be no doubts in this system that the right to regulate is upheld. That, that is the number one concern of the Commission. Um, I imagine, and we know that's a very important concern of the people present today. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. We really appreciate that you, you came. And um, I think you have made interesting remarks about the, the two uh, uh, presentations of, of our guests. And I think it would be fair to, to get a good start for our exchange with yourselves. If uh, perhaps uh, with a few <laughs> remarks, would you want to comment? Well, I wonder if it's fair for me now to comment on this. But if you do give me the floor, <laughs> yeah, some some key remarks, perhaps. So, so we get three, a three of remarks, contradictory. So, three know. more <laughs> remarks. And now you have to remember, I'm just a professor. Really, I'm not a bureaucrat. I'm not responsible. There's nobody sitting on my head to whom I would have to explain what I say. Uh, whereas that's not the situation with all of us. You have to realize that. Uh, so, three points. One is, so Colin's presentation, um, of course made no, point, no reference to why this system would be needed. I'm still waiting for the explanation. In the, from the American delegation, I did get an explanation which for me was trustworthy. I've explained to you what they told me, my first point. My second point will be about the 3,200 bilateral investment treaties. It's true that uh, countries have signed those treaties as part of mostly, almost 70, 80, maybe 90 percent of the cases, in, in situations where the, the balance between the two parties is completely unequal. On the one hand, there is the investment exporting country, the developed country that wants to export in a developing country, or a less developed Central or Eastern European country. And because that country doesn't trust the legal system of the developing country, or the Central European country. Uh, they want to take those cases relating to those investments away. So this, of course, could be traced to the 1880s, 1890s, when Americans first started to make with Latin American countries conventions against which the famous, infamous Calvo Clause was once uh, developed in order to prevent American economic domination in Latin America. The, all of this has to be, the 3,200 treaties have to be put in place in an unequal economic relationship. And the embarrassing fact is that now that the sharp end of the sword, the sharp end of the sword, all of a sudden turns against Europe. We are, oh, well, we too? But that's how it is. Um, and my third point uh, uh, is about the optimism of the Commission. So Colin said, of course from his position, I understand, that it's only when it's a clear breach of standards, you know, it's only when it's good faith. We've really been awful for these Americans. And you, can, you must understand a small American company being splashed and you completely ripped apart by powerful European uh, communes and um, parliament, etc. So, surely, uh, well, no, it's not like that. 
So please read the Argentinian financial crisis. Please read about the hedge funds. Please read about the vulture funds. Please read about what happened when Eureko, a big Dutch um, uh, insurance company, raised a case against Poland and then settled out of court and Poland paced, uh, paid Eureko for its participation in a privatization scheme in Poland when a new government set up and limited the privatization scheme that cost to Poland 2 billion, 2 billion euros. So my main point, which Colin didn't even have the courtesy to refer to, was that it's not the cases, it's not the cases that matter. These negotiations take place in the shadow of the arbitration tribunal. So the Commission wants us to be obsessed about the peak of the iceberg. No, I think we should think about the iceberg. We, it's Titanic, after all, on which we are. Thank you. So, um, Harm? Where do I go after that? Um, <coughs> I've only uh, one point to make, and that is about Collins' um, uh, reference to uh, the Lowen case, which is this case in Mississippi. Um, I am deeply uh, nervous about uh, people who, like me, oppose uh, ISDS referring to particular cases, Vattenfeld and Philip Morris and all of that. Um, but what gets even more on my nerves is this um, constant reference to um, the Lowen case. It is true that this was a case about discrimination. It was about discrimination on all sorts of grounds not just a Canadian um, entrepreneur in Mississippi, it was a white entrepreneur in a predominantly black um, um, uh, neighborhood, neighborhood state and a black jury and a black judge. It was a Jewish white entrepreneur in a predominantly black state with a black jury and a black judge. What I'm saying is the Lowen case speaks to all sorts of extremely painful issues in the United States, and to reduce this to the issue of a foreign investor in the United States is um, a reduction in, in, to the absurd. Especially for this reason, investment law will not solve those issues. It is impossible to think that the many wrongs in the state of Mississippi will be solved in any way by this enlightened liberal um, investment law. That is just a, um, a, a tangent, but I felt it important to say it. Yeah. Thank you very much. So now it's my pleasure to open the floor for questions and, and remarks. Uh, please. And I said everyone in the room has the right to take the floor. I see the first speaker, yes, exactly you, gentleman with the uh, uh, tie with stripes. Yeah. If you would be so kind like to me. present yourself. It's you, yes. Yeah. My name is Gus Van Harten. I'm a law professor from uh, Canada. And uh, uh, I hope you'll forgive me, but I, I, do, I couldn't resist uh, saying something. Uh, and I hope in particular Colin will forgive me because I'm going to respond to something he said. And uh, I do sympathize with Colin because I tend to agree with the others that when you really look at this system closely, it is very difficult to defend. And uh, what uh, dismays me is some of the tactics resorted to in defending this system. And some of the tactics include um, you know, spreading of numbers that are highly misleading. Uh, if not completely inaccurate. Um, and I don't attribute this to Colin. I am sure in good faith he's picking up numbers that someone else has put out there. So he referenced a study prepared, uh, it was actually prepared by Christian Tietje, uh, Freya Betens, and uh, an outfit called Acorus in uh, the Netherlands. And it was uh, commissioned by the Dutch Trade and Foreign Affairs Ministry and then submitted to the Dutch Parliament. And this study stated that 9% of uh, uh, ICSID cases and basically all investment treaty cases was a suggestion or the large number of them were um, resulted from legislative decisions. Uh, and alongside that were various claims that there, uh, most cases were, were executive decisions and very specific decisions. That study, uh, that report 
I hesitate to call it a study because I think it was such such so poorly done. I don't think it deserves a word. But that report uh, referenced uh, a study by Nate Jensen, a chap named Jeremy Cadell, who are American uh, political scientists. And the numbers were drawn from a study that they did, where they uh, made this statement that. Uh, investment treaty cases, they looked at 163, uh, only 14 involved legislative decision. Well, I had uh, coded the same issue and uh, had some quite different results which I'd published six months earlier and made all the data publicly available and none of it, of course, was cited by Cadell and Jensen and certainly not by the, the Dutch uh, report writers. And I found, I counted um, 60 cases that involved challenge to legislative decisions in a sample of 162 investment treaty cases decided up until spring 2010. So it's a very similar data set to Cadell and Jensen. So uh, I saw their report in spring of 2014 and I emailed them and asked them, wow, why the discrepancy? You counted 14 and I got 60. What's going on? And I looked at their um, their methodology which they had uh, appropriately published and found that they had only counted cases where they thought it was the primary decision challenged. Most of these cases involve challenges to decisions that emanate from multiple branches of the state. Almost all cases involve some degree of executive conduct and any challenge to a case involving legislation is of course going to involve executive conduct because in almost all cases the legislation has to be implemented. So it would be very surprising to find a case that involves solely a legislative decision. It's almost always going to go with the executive decision. Cadell and Jensen's numbers fell dramatically because they actually exercised discretion in their coding to weed out many cases where they thought the legislative decision being challenged was secondary to the executive conduct. Uh, that's legitimate as a research technique. Uh, I, I think that's acceptable. It should be reported clearly. It was not in their report of their study. They went so far as to recommend that legislatures, and I use their word, embrace investor state arbitration based on this clearly understated characterization of the frequency with which legislative decisions are challenged in cases. I pointed all this out to them in an email. Uh, Nate Jensen agreed that it was, uh, it was, it was a very friendly exchange. Uh, Nate Jensen agreed that it was because of that methodological choice uh, that they had gotten such low, a lower uh, figure. And shortly after, they uh, pumped out their study on the infamous mailing list Ojamid without mentioning the point. Uh, that study then gets picked up in the Dutch study and actually gets taken a bit farther. The, the Jensen and Cadell use the words associated with legislative decisions. In the Dutch study, they use the word, uh, a word resulted from, which makes the claim clearly inaccurate in the Dutch study to say 9% resulted from legislative decisions. Uh, it's more like 37%. At least that's the number I came up with. That's an approximate figure too, but I think we can approximately say by relying on a study that did not take, make clear how the researchers use their own discretion to determine primary decisions that have been challenged, the number of cases involved in legislative measures was cut uh, by, uh, from, by, by a, a, fig, a factor of four. And this study is now being cited all over the place from what I'm told, uh, fairly recently to my shock and horror, uh, in Europe uh, as an indicator that legislative decisions aren't challenged and legislators don't have anything to worry about and general decisions aren't challenged. On the point of general decisions, I also tried to code this. This is very difficult to code. I, I came out with about, uh, my approach was, is this a decision that appears to be relevant in a significant way to actors other than the claimant or small related group, and, the, and uh, I got about 50%, okay? And even some of the specific cases are, you know, pretty major contracts for an economy, but they're contractual disputes, so they're kind of specific. But I, I really find that 10% claim is just totally dubious. And I find it so troubling, and it's not, it's not the first instance, just completely inaccurate numbers being pumped out. And uh, what is going on? It, it suggests either a conscious attempt to mislead decision makers or a lack of knowledge about really basic information about what's going on in this system. And I'm not, frankly not sure which is worse. 
Um, so I don't mean, I, again, I don't mean to put Colin on the spot. I'm sure in good faith he's citing a study that is widely studied. I'm just trying to uh, ask him, please never cite that number again from that study. That study, uh, I can go on a bit more about how that study misrepresented the Ethel versus Canada case, but I'm sure I've gone on way too long already. I just wanted to make the point uh, there's a lot of misinformation being spread right now. Thank you very much, Professor Van Harten. It's an honor to meet you. I didn't recognize you. You know that we tried to accommodate you into this uh, hearing, but uh, then we had problems with timing. So you're most welcome. And I would like to thank you very much for your remark that also legislation has to be implemented. So um, to, to clarify the numbers that you, you mentioned concerning the challenges. Now, anyone else uh, wanting to take the floor? Uh, yes, please. Uh, yes, you. I think it's a young man with a with a tile red uh, sweater. Is that you didn't? Oh, another professor. So I was looking behind me. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, I wondered just uh, the recent case in in Mikula, which is a case where a foreign investor in, uh, won against uh, uh, Romania for Romania claiming back money. Um, which it had to claim back under EU uh, um, state aid law. Um, isn't that an, an, a case which shows that it is more or less impossible sometimes to reconcile European law investment law? Or if there is a way of reconciling that, um, how, how does the, the CETA or maybe the future TTIP agreement provide that this kind of situation doesn't happen again? Thank you. By the way, I forgot to ask if you could present yourself, please. I'm sorry. Jan Kleinheist, I come from the London School of Economics. Uh, more questions, remarks? Yes, Yannick Jadot, MEP from the Greens. Thank you for this introduction. Uh, thank you very much to the uh, speakers who clearly explained that it's not a question of whether we could change this or reform this on this. It's a question of principle, and I think this is very important in the EP discussion. I just would like to, to, to raise the issue of a, a new field of regulation, which is a digital economy or digital agenda. It's clearly one field where the, uh, the, 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 the overall capitalization, I think it's 85% US, 2% EU, and this is a, f a whole, f whole field where the EU is uh, to bring new regulation in the years to come. So clearly in s with such a, po a balance of power in such a new uh, field of regulation, I mean, ISDS, it's a huge threat to any EU specifics on this. Thank you. Thank you very much, Yannick. Anyone? Yes, please. Hi, it's so Andres Walstad from Interfax Europe. Um, uh, Professor Koski near me, uh, you mentioned arbitration. One of your concerns was that arbitrations are technically poor. Uh, you, you mentioned vested interests and so on. I was wondering perhaps if you could give, uh, elaborate a little bit on this and give, give a few examples. And perhaps also you, you want to share your view on the Orland case and the green certificates uh, as you come from Finland. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, still there's space for one or two questions. Yes, please. You. Thank you. My name is Mario. I work for uh, an Irish member of the European Parliament in the S&D group. Uh, I would like to, to ask the panelists uh, if they have any insight into, into um, the recent JTI tobacco uh, legal threats that were issued officially against the Irish government. Um, they, they threatened that they would take um, the Irish government to the Irish High Court if they pressed on with uh, their uh, uh, bill uh, to introduce plain packaging. And uh, I would like to, to know if you would have any insight into how uh, this company's legal strategy might differ if, if uh, um, uh, certain ISDS clauses that are cur currently in the process of being negotiated uh, were already to be in place. Uh, and also, uh, I'd like to make a point that perhaps y you want to comment on, which relates to just plain legal trolling, which is uh, a very common tactic in the U.S. legal system, where parties with uh, uh, good access to high-paid uh, legal resources routinely uh, use the legal
legal system to basically suffocate financially and even psychologically uh, their counterparties. And th 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 this, this point about whether the people we're dealing with are in good faith or not seems plain uh, moot to me because th that's the very reason why we need legal systems at a domestic and international level is because uh, uh, we, we live in societies that uh, have evolved into... Uh, a legalistic means of uh, uh, solving disputes. If we were all uh, uh, able to assume everyone's in good faith, we wouldn't need constitutions even to start with. We're human beings. So that seems to be a bit of a moot point. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, yes, uh, Scott Keller, MEP from the Greens and also responsible for ISDS work in our group. Thanks a lot. I um, would just like to know from the panellists uh, what they think of this um, ideas that have been popping up uh, recently about creating this international accord uh, of um, investor arbitration. And um, there is also different views about, first of all, whether it should be existent, but also like what sort of place does it have in the whole legal system and whether you have any comments on that. Thank you. Thank you, Ska. Okay, now perhaps we give the floor to our speakers. I would this time start with um, uh, Harm, uh, then give the floor to Marty and then uh, to, to Colin. So Harm, please start and, and pick up the questions that you want to be addressing. Um, combining two questions, I couldn't help notice a bit of a, a, a legal scandal in those Irish cases because counsel for JDA Tobacco tends to work for the Irish government here and there and has all sorts of strange contracts. Um, how would it change the litigation strategy? Well, we, we, we know what happened um, with, with Philip Morris in Australia. They, they uh, tried absolutely everything. And so a constitutional claim for deprivation of property rights, a um, investment arbitration claim for deprivation of trademarks and so on and so forth. It adds to the, to the arsenal. Which one is more uh, likely to succeed? I don't know. I actually don't think that particular case in ISDS will succeed. Um, I also don't think that if it doesn't succeed, that detracts in any way from the strength of the arguments against ISDS. Um, one thing about the, the plans that are popping up for a, um, a, a permanent uh, court, uh, it is first um, a bit late in the game for people to um, present this now. I don't know if the plan is to open up CETA to introduce a, a permanent court. I'm not sure if this is an appeals court or a court of first instance. I'm not sure who's going to pay for this. I'm not sure if the plan is that this is into a multilateral treaty framework or whether the plan is to set one up in a bilateral um, framework. Um, and so I don't really uh, see uh, uh, how this is going exactly. Um, but on the general principle, it's, it's very simple. A permanent court of independent salaried judges who are not allowed to do anything but adjudicate um, is a vast improvement on the current system of, of, of arbitrators and would help alleviate uh, some of the uh, problems that we have. Uh, before giving the floor to Marty, let me add one question. I, I picked up um, one thing, among other things, that you said. You said that global standards, it is standards of global operators, if I'm not mistaken. And um, uh, do you see a case for a, let's say, fair, uh, reasonably balanced uh, multilateral agreement on uh, investments? Uh, not the way it was done within the OECD uh, years back, but um, uh, perhaps in, uh, in a more representative uh, body, uh, perhaps even the WTO, perhaps, um, I don't know, UN. Is, is there any sort of thinking, even academic thinking, around these kind of ideas? Uh, there's a lot of stuff on the table. Uh, first question for me was about vested interests and the poor quality of arbitrations. Now, I, I could speak at length uh, on that. Let me just say that the, quest the fact that arbitrators often act as counsel for parties um, and then become, again, arbitrators, then counsel, uh, has been widely recognized as an ethical problem also among the 
uh, the group of arbitrators themselves. This group is extraordinarily small and people know each other very well. So here is one fact that 15 persons, 15 individuals have sat in 55% of the cases. So we are speaking about roughly speaking 60 persons who are in this circuit and they are constantly choosing each other into these panels as, as presidents and being usually either leaned towards the industries, in which case they are appointed as arbitrator on the investor side, or leaning towards the gov government, perhaps uh, labor uh, supporters or so, and they, are, they then represent the government. But it's the small circle, uh, and um, the, the, uh, the debates on an ethical code were underway before TTIP started, but then got frozen, like other efforts from the internal, from, from the inside of the exit system to reform the system. The technically poor quality is also r widely accepted. This, of course, refers back to what this substantive standards in the relevant BIT treaty is. And sometimes those standards are extremely open-ended. For instance, refer only to unjust or discriminatory treatment or fair and equitable treatment. So they leave for the arbitrators to decide. There are many cases where uh, these uh, where same facts have been used to decide differently in Argentina. I, th I think I mentioned um, the treatment of the uh, financial necessity um, reference. Sometimes arbitrators accept it, sometimes they don't accept it. And that's natural because it's different people every uh, time differently. So this has been accepted as a big problem. I, I uh, I realize that we are here journalists or MPs working as bureaucrats. We don't have time. But if you do have time, so there's a wonderful book called Dealing in Virtue. Dealing in Virtue by, by two American legal sociologists, Yves de Zale and Brian Garth. Dealing in Virtue, it's a sociological description of the circuit of arbitrators. You read it and you don't sleep, but read it nevertheless. <laughs> Uh, then there's the, uh, the question of all and islands, of which I am, I am uh, unfortunately have to say I haven't got a clue. I don't know this case. Uh, then there's the question of bad faith and trolling, and I think I agree with the person who uh, rhetorically posed the question. In some, way, some ways, bad faith is moot. But I'm making that point in order for us to look in the right place and to suggest to the Commission that they should come to deal with some of the darkest actors in the world, the, the voucher funds, and to look at how they've operated in the context of the Argentinian claims um, and l lay out the standard on that basis. Uh, the American litigation, as you pointed out, is very different from European litigation. Americans regularly use litigation or political operations in the shadow of litigation in order to have political influence, in order to influence political decision makers. So the, the influence to legislation here, let me underline this over and over again. The influence is not that there is a case and it's decided and then the uh, legislators are scared the hell out of them. No, the influence takes place prior to the legislation. It's in the negotiation when the hand of the great um, Virtue 500 company uh, is empowered to say to the domestic regulator, you regulate as I want or see you in court. There's no place where this has been, where there would have been statistics for reasons that you and I understand. But we know the world, I hope. Um, and then there was one question, so the, the International uh, Court of, uh, the Court of International Arbitration. So, the Court of International, so in a neoliberal world, courts are a big thing. And it's interesting to follow the rise and what happens after the rise of the International Criminal Court, the Rome Treaty. The International Criminal Court is in great trouble. The WTO debates on expanding the jurisdiction of the WEO, including the dispute settlement understanding, the panel system and the, and the appellate body haven't proceeded anywhere because of the predictable problems that there are because of the inequality of the world. So it's hard to negotiate 
with the world being such as it is. That's why the bilateral system has been used to set up a de facto standard. It's not as if we forgot that there is the multilateral uh, way also available to us. It is to impose a de facto global standard by bilateral way because the bargain, bargaining power in a bilateral negotiation is very different from in a multilateral context. So, of course, I wish there were a world court. Even Immanuel Kant wished there was one. But, but it's not, the world is not like that. And we have to kind of face it. And one would hope that the, the Commission would deal with the world as it is and not this imaginary construction that it has built around itself. Now it's perhaps uh, time to give the floor to the European Commission. Thank you very much. I guess I can try to defend the imaginary construction that I seem to be living in. Um, let, let me, um, first of all, thank you for all of the, the questions and, and the comments, and let me um, respond um, to some of them. Um, first of all, it was a pleasure to see um, Gus here and to make these points on the, um, uh, on, on the study. Um, we are, um, these are the types of things that we, we look at very carefully. We'll, go back and look at that study um, again. I think it remains the case um, that the bulk of these cases that we see are against uh, individual decisions concerning um, uh, individual one or two uh, small number of, of companies. And if Gus's request is directed at us, I think the, the request should also go to the debate in general. There's a lot of, unfortunately, there's a lot of misinformation uh, in the debate on ISDS, um, and it's something that the Commission has tried to respond to, um, um, but um, there are many people that have to look at um, how we, um, the information is presented. On um, Jan, uh, Professor klein camps question on the Makula case. The Makula case, let me, without getting into all of the details, is a case under the Sweden-Romania Bilateral Investment Treaty concerning subsidies that were granted to the, uh, a number of companies owned by the Makula brothers. Um, the subsidies were provided from the late 1990s and scheduled to end, I think, in 2009. Um, now, the, um, the tribunal that looked at, at, at that case was in a situation of pre-accession to, to the EU. And so it was, it was examining how Romania said that it would handle those particular subsidies uh, on the basis of the Europe Agreement, which was the predecessor or the, or the agreement that was in place before Romania joined the, the EU. And I think a lot of the statements um, that were made were based on that particular factual um, and legal context. Um, I'm not sure that we in the Commission would agree with them, but I think what is quite clear is that when one looks at the concept of legitimate expectations, the, that tribunal confirmed, and as have others, that the, the legitimate expectation has to be reasonable. And so in our view, once you are post-accession, there can be no doubt that an operator in the EU does not have uh, a legitimate expectation that a particular subsidy will be granted. And the way we think, I won't go into all of the details just now, but the way we think SET and, um, and, and the other agreements will operate would be to continue to ensure that um, state aid granted um, uh, post-accession would be subject to the full um, weight of um, EU, um, uh, EU state aid law. Um, on the issue of the tobacco litigation in, um, in Ireland, indeed, that is it's on the um, Irish implementation of the tobacco directive at EU level, so there's no um, um, ISDS um, involved in that. Commission's view is that the agreements that it has that negotiated, in particular, in particular CETA uh, and Singapore, would provide clarity to make sure that Philip Morris case uh, against plain packaging would not be successful under EU agreements. And that is done through two mechanisms, clarity on the fair and equitable treatment standard and clarity on indirect um, expropriation. So we, we have worked um, in our view to ad address that issue. Um, a couple of things on um, good faith and whether the Commission is optimistic, um, lives in a world of, of optimism. Um, no, I mean, I, I am responsible for working on this policy for the last three or four years. 
Before that, I did 15 years of litigation, both in, in the Court of Justice and the World Trade Organization. Mm -hmm. So my, um, my exposure and the, the, the exposure of the institution to litigation is very high, and we have no illusions about, about these types of things. What matters, though, and this is why the rule I talked about on the loser paying, what matters in these things is money. If an investor knows that it has no chance of winning, or that if it takes a risk, it will have to pay, um, the chances of it actually bringing litigation just to put pressure, in our view, will be much, much less. And that, that's not a, an optimistic hope. That, that is a, a reflection on the reality of how litigation works, in particular with clarity on this, uh, this particular rule. And I think that applies to the way what, um, what Marty referred to in terms of third-party financing and, and so-called vulture funds. They will be aware that if they start to bring a, a case under the EU agreements, then they will run the risk of having to pay um, all of the cost of the arbitration and all of the cost of the lawyers employed by the other side. I'm not going to get into Ms Keller's question on the investment court, not because I'm not interested, I'm very interested, but because the Commission is working um, on issues on how to improve the um, arbitrator's um, choice, uh, the choice of arbitrators and how that will, will function. But I would draw your attention to a multilateral initiative, which is only there because the EU has pushed it, and that is the application of the transparency rules for investor state dispute settlement. Thanks in a large part to the EU, there is now a convention that should be signed on the 17th of March, in a couple of weeks' time, that would allow, it's a multilateral convention on transparency, that would allow transparency to apply to all 3,200 existing treaties. And the decisions on, on that, uh, for the EU to sign to that convention, are about to come before the, the Parliament in the, in the near future. Mm -hmm. um, so that's an interesting example of multilateral work mm -hmm. in this area pushed by the EU. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Thank, you. Thank you very much, Colin. Now, uh, the last uh, two, three minutes, I would like to uh, dedicate to the final uh, comment by Scar Keller, who is also responsible. To for, for the thinking of uh, how we should go on uh, our work in the, in the intercommittee on, on ISDS. Thanks, Heidi, and thanks everybody who has organized this conference as well as who has contributed uh, to this conference. Thanks a lot to our speakers, and I absolutely do not want to repeat all the many arguments that have been brought up. Um, but in conclusion, I would uh, say that indeed, as has been pointed out, there is a lot of problems that are still linked to ISDS. A lot of questions have been raised, and I think what is clear for me, not after this debate uh, even more than before, is that we're really talking about the core. We're talking about the whether or not. I think this is the step to take, and we have to take it urgently, because if the European Union gets involved in signing agreements, be the first one now, CETA, be it Singapore, that includes an ISDS, we will for the first time have an EU agreement with ISDS, and that will set a precedence for every other trade agreement. That's why it's so important to look now into it, and indeed to know as legislators what we're signing up to there. And that I find extremely important. But really, it's about the whether or not. It's not so much about the reform and which little bits can be turned around. It's about the whether or not. That's why I was was quite disappointed that in the consultation you didn't ask about the whether or not, you only asked about the, the reforms you were doing. But really, I think we have to decide first on the whether or not, and I have huge question marks, and the question of which problem is this solution fitting for, I think still remains to be um, addressed. Um, also, the question of why inter investors who are not subjects of international law should get another treatment or special treatment vis-a-vis citizens or people who are, for example, suffering from investors, which also happens. What's their rights and what's their obligations? And one issue that has been brought up on the panel I also want to point out, namely, that uh, it's not just, or we at least should try not to just have an ISDS debate about Europe. Member states have signed um, bilateral treaties, as it has been mentioned, but also ISDS is in the discussion of many other treaties, for example, India. Uh, which is the biggest producer of generic medicine for, uh, for very poor countries. So I really hope that all of us and beyond this room are thinking about ISDS as a problem in general, if they're thinking about it as a problem, <laughs> or at least an issue that, or a challenge, whatever, that affects not just us, but that it affects also other people, and that we don't turn away uh, our eyes and our attention 
in case this problem is no longer applicable to us. It really is a problem for the whole world, and for me it's still a question about the weather and not, and not just in which disguise. Thank you very much. Thanks to Heidi and thanks to the speakers. Yeah. Thank you very much, Scar. Thank you, everyone, for coming. I think um, uh, the uh, solutions and um, with, with each with uh, a lot of new problems, at least one, uh, will have, have been registered, and, and we're going to work on those. We are going to, to see how this parliament will, with, will take its full responsibility on, uh, on responding and, and taking its stand on ISDS. So thank you very much. I hope that this communication will go on. And a special thanks to, to Professor Van Harten, who decided to come here anyway, even if he couldn't formally <laughs> agree to be here. So thanks so much, everyone. Okay.